Good morning and welcome to Galway Politics Live. Here we are um, in the Insight studio today and I'm joined by um, some special guests and my co-host Mike Garrity. Mike, would you like to introduce our guest to I us? I would indeed. Good morning, Neil, and good morning, viewers. Apologies, we're running a few minutes late this morning due to technical difficulties. Uh, so our guest this morning, we have um, Joe Lachnan, we have Mary Maloney, and we have uh, Aaron Asan. And I'm going to get them to talk a little bit about themselves. Uh, so, Joe, would you like to open it up and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, thanks to Mike and Neil for uh, inviting me on to speak here. Um, my name is Joe Lachnan. I'm the chairperson of the Galway Anti-Racism Network and I'm the local area representative for People Before Profit. Um, and I suppose I'm, I'm on this panel today to kind of just give an insight from an equality perspective in relation to the issue of disability in Galway and Ireland. Excellent. Okay. So, Marion, would you like to say a few words? Do you want to hold it? Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks to uh, Mike and Neil for having me. And Mike did forget to introduce a very <laughs> important uh, four-legged person. He did. He did. <laughs> so uh, Leon. Leon is down here at my feet. So uh, if there's any strange noises, you'll know where they're coming from. And um, as Mike said, my name is Marion Maloney. I'm a disability activist here in Galway, involved in too many groups to go go through it. But looking uh, forward. Marion, you can't have too many, can you? You can't have too many. <laughs> looking forward to a nice lively conversation thank you Thanks okay uh, hi i'm aaron uh, uh, most of you uh, probably haven't seen me on tv before um i um i'm a wheelchair user and uh, i've uh, in the past few years got involved with um, um advocacy um for people with disabilities um and i suppose my speciality would be wheelchair users um and then um we have uh, other people in the panel that are experts in in their own field as well so that's great i'm looking forward to the discussion okay um aaron we we, we start with you um, with the questions i mean we're, we're talking here about disability um today general very broad sense of the word do you want to give him the microphone back mike um because he's he'll be um vocally disabled if we, if we don't do that um so there's many different types of disability aaron i mean would you like to just describe the sort of disabilities that there are um in you know people in galway might have or might be familiar with and maybe some that they're not so familiar with yeah. um i suppose for, for i can only speak from my experience and, and what i've come across um uh, throughout my lifetime um, there are various disabilities um, and 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 uh, there's obviously the physical and, yeah there's and there's there is the physical and also we have intellectual disabilities um, and each of these types of disability have their own spectrum uh, and um, so what might be accessible what something might be accessible to me might not be accessible to someone else uh, be, due to the nature of the disability um, as Marion might tell you uh, there are very various type of people with visual impairments um, and and I've started um, using the word variable abilities uh, instead of disability because we 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 all have um, strengths and weaknesses and it doesn't matter if you're um, a person walking or if you're a person we're using a wheelchair and uh, the nature the nature of your impairment or or your challenges that, that you have varies so um i think uh, variable abilities works really well um so um yeah um that's uh, that, that's what i think okay so w maybe we put the same question to marion i mean you you've been a long time campaigner marion um yeah neil just to to for people that wouldn't really understand the the official categories of of people with disability or disabled people which uh, we in the independent living movement prefer to call ourselves now disabled people because it's it's society and attitudes that are disabling us uh, there are five categories there's physical uh, sensory, 
mental, emotional, intellectual, and you have the hidden. And mm. within each of those categories, there are various different disabilities. My own community of the blind and visually impaired, like I'm not totally blind. I have a tiny little bit of sight, but yet the little bit of sight that I have is beginning now to be of no use to me. So um, even though people, when they see me out, they say, well, you don't look blind. And my response to that is, well, how the hell am I meant to look? <laughs> you know, or are you training the dog? I said, no, he's my you dog. You have to wear the cliche yeah, dark sunglasses yeah. and have a big white cane in front exactly, of you. Is that it? Yeah. So it's it's the stereotype and the assumption. People just make assumptions if they see you being able to move. If I got up now off this chair at this minute and walked over, I'd probably fall over something. Uh, Leon had the microphone hiding under him a while ago. <laughs> but um, there are so many different impairments within each category. But still, even saying that, there is the thread that links us all together. We all want our education for our young children. We all want to, for them to go to college, go to, you know, secondary school, college, um, have their own home, have, you know, transport. So there, all of those things, you know, that, that we need, they link us all together in a huge way. Yeah, we're all humans. What, what about you, Joe? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose again, speaking as somebody who you know who who wouldn't be defined as having a, a wouldn't be defined as being disabled, um, my experience, you know, at being a, an academic personal assistant to students with disabilities in in NUIG, it, for, at a young age, I realised, I suppose, the privilege I had as an able-bodied person because I didn't realise just the amount of barriers that are in the way, just you know, in your going about your daily business for. And as Marion and, and Aaron had both outlined, whether it was one of the five type of disabilities that, you know, the different categories they come in, there are different barriers that are in your way that kind of allow you to live a, a kind of independent life. And what, what I was doing in NUIG for a while with a couple of students was taking their notes from them and explaining it back to them. But even then I felt, you know, there's so much more we could be doing here. You know, um, it, it, a lot of it at the time when we do accommodate our city for people with disabilities, it's a box ticking exercise rather than an actual concrete decision to change something, which is, I suppose, my perspective. Can I just come in there and say that um, I was just trying to do a little bit of research before this morning's broadcast. There is 13% of people in Galway City with some kind of an impairment. 13%? 10,133 10, 10, people. Where are ye, everybody? 10,133 people. And if you want to look up the fact sheet, the Disability Federation of Ireland have a fact sheet on their website. It's a Galway City profile that they would have done uh, for the elections in May, and it's taken from the 2016 census. Mm -hmm. It's very informative and it breaks it all down. Now, I can't remember off the top of my head because I wasn't able to bring notes here, mm. but I do remember that the blind and visually impaired community is over 800. So we're a very small part of that 10,000. Yeah. Yeah, what you're saying really, Marion, in effect, is that everybody is affected by disability yeah. because, I mean, we're all part of the one community. I mean, I have a son, for example, who, you know, has a, an exactly. intellectual disability. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I have many friends, um, you know, who, who have various different types of disability. And, you know, I think I think society in general wants to, um, you know, to cater for everybody with a disability. But I don't think it actually does it to an extent that anybody is happy about it. Do you know? No, and I think that it's up to ourselves. I know for me personally um, that it's up to me to educate people. If they do something mm. wrong, if I feel they're mm. doing something wrong in, we'll say, uh, my access needs or whatever, or if they say something or push me in a different way. I'll just give you an example if Mike doesn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> when we were coming in the door to this building, I've never been in it before. So uh, Leon wasn't much good to me because I couldn't give Leon directions. So I was linking Mike as putting Mike as a sighted guide and Mike was telling the dog to go in first. I said, hold on a minute, Mike, <laughs> it's the sighted person that goes first. So just little things like yeah. that. I learn something new <laughs> all the time here. It's really good, folks. <laughs> you know, Thanks, so Leon. There, there, there's tiny, you know, there's tiny little things that yeah. um, that if we have the courage to say in a nice way, and I think I said it in a nice you way, did. Mike, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, to say it in a nice way and not, you know, I mean, 
people sometimes, I know when I was a cane user first here in Galway City, when I got the courage to start using the cane, you know, if you were waiting to cross the road, somebody would have the um, immediate reaction to catch you by your elbow and push you out out in the road, you know, which is completely the wrong thing to yeah. do, you know. Yeah, that's an interesting so, point, Marion. You said when you had the courage to start using the cane, because I, I, I know with my, my young son, you know, when we took him to a supermarket and he, he acted in a very strange way, which he did, he'd lie down on the floor and he'd do, you know, mm -hmm. and people would say, can you not control your kid? Yeah. But yeah. when you had a dog, um, then he had a disability dog with him yes, and everybody I would know. Indy very well. Indy yeah. the dog. Yeah. Yeah. Indy, yes. But people would then know that, you know, was it wasn't just an ordinary situation mm. with a little brat of a kid in their view, because that's what they thought, do you know? Well, you see, I have been visually impaired all my life and I suppose I did have a little bit more useful vision back mm. in the day, as we mm. say. And I would have started using my long cane only in 2000, which isn't too long ago at all. You know, mm. when you think of, of the way time goes yeah. and um, it was at that stage that I had been um, advised to kind of put myself forward to go on a scheme because I'm a qualified Irish dancing teacher, but I had retired from active teaching. I won't go into that. We'll be here all day and all night. <laughs> but, um, you know, I had kind of been advised to kind of change careers and, and I was at the stage now that I was getting out there more on my own and I thought, oops, I'm out here on my own, what am I going to do? So I thought, yeah, I better start using my long cane, you know, and I went to the NCBI, I got the training with the long cane and I remember one time in the early stages going through the Air Square Centre and my youngest daughter was with me and she said, oh, mom, I hate the way people turn around and look at you, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I said, are you sure, what the heck, sure, I can't see them looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, my uh, my attitude to that was they were probably looking and saying, well, why is she using that white cane? You know, because I am, thank God, I am blessed with healthy looking eyes. Yeah. They can't see you, yeah. but they're looking healthy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I suppose I have developed skills. Uh, my Irish dancing did an awful lot for me in, in developing my skills in that I do look at people when I'm talking and people yeah. say, but you are making eye contact well, with me. Like but Joe, I can't see you. And do you still do good looking do the Irish dancing, Marion, do you? Do you still do the Irish no, dancing? No, I haven't danced in quite a long, long time now. Ah, well, so fair <laughs> enough. I'll have to try and get back to it. Yeah, but it is it, uh, definitely, I have to say, the love of my life. It did an awful lot for me. Yeah. yeah. So back to the back to the skills. We'll bring Aaron in here as a photographer. Mm -hmm. And maybe you'll tell us a little bit about what it's like around Galway. Um, yeah, um, some of you might know me, um, um, I often go to Monroe's uh, for the uh, <laughs> yeah. Latin dancing um, uh, Wednesdays um, and um, uh, I've been a photographer for over 10 years um, and of course uh, uh, when I first started um, taking photos of uh, people dancing uh, a lot of people were like oh, what's a wheelchair user doing on the dance floor? Uh, so, yeah. so I had I had a lot of um, um, challenges. Uh, uh, they wouldn't take me seriously as a photographer uh, just because I was a wheelchair user or something like that. Um, so it was it was it was um, emotionally hard at the at the start when when I started first. Um, but I'm uh, I love dancing. Uh, since I was younger, I was uh, imagining being on the on the dance floor and all that kind of stuff. And it's just I just love the atmosphere of, of it all. Um, I haven't I haven't met a professional photographer who's a wheelchair user yet in Galway City. I'm sure there's a lot of views out there. Uh, so uh, if you want to if you want to work together, you know what to do. Get in touch with me, and uh, we can do a project. Um, uh, apart from that, I'm um, I'm also a receptionist um, in the Baliban Resort Centre, so I, I uh, enjoy working there as well. Um, and um, um, I'm a video editor as well. Um, on top of that, so yeah, yeah. I so have lots of skills. Uh, in fairness, if there's anybody out there now watching us today or in the future who is a photographer and is wheelchair bound i mean you know get in touch with aaron i mean it's yeah. aaron Asson, isn't that right that's aaron right Asson. Yeah, 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 yeah 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 so you're 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 well known on facebook really aaron i think oh uh, well um 
uh, it's, it's no good to be too popular. <laughs> mm, I know, I know, I remember. <laughs> Listen, what I want to do... Um, Sorry, Neil, before you go any further, I do have to correct you on something or I will be shot tomorrow if Okay, I don't. please tell me that. Uh, terminology is very important. So you're after using a term there, wheelchair bound. Now, you're in good company because Ray Darcy did it just a couple of weeks back on a radio programme as well. The correct term for a wheelchair is wheelchair user. Wheelchair user. Wheelchair okay, user. I, yeah, yeah. I do apologise for that. You should have uh, maybe Aaron didn't pick it up, but um. Aaron's probably heard it all before. He's probably heard it all before. Yeah. Now I'm not. I suppose I'm not a real stickler for for language as such because I think that if if we are too much, but that is one term that I just cannot abide by because the person is not bound to that chair yeah. would you agree with me Aaron or am I off the wall saying that yeah. yeah no well I mean I think I think that's a fair comment Mary and I have to I have to take take it on the chin that one now so sorry about that Aaron um this is very much a solutions based show though and one of the things I want to put to you all really I suppose our three guests in particular but Mike might have some views on that as well is you know Say the minister for, um, well, say say the Taoiseach came down and said, look, lads, look, Joe, yeah. let's let's put it to you, Joe. I mean, look, I, ha I, have, I have a billion euros yeah. to spend in Galway on disability in general. And, you know, we can we can change the laws whatever way you'd like. Basically, you're the king of disability in Galway. Yeah. Yeah. You can do what you like. There's no barriers. There's no money. There's no legal. There's no legislative barriers. Yeah. What would you do? Um. I suppose whenever I'm asked this question, I, I always think back to when I first got active in politics, you know, around the time of the recession, about 10 years ago, or even just before that. And when I seen the cuts that were happening to various aspects of, you know, carers allowances and other aspects of the people who were who were carers, a lot of those cuts were never reversed. So I always say whenever and whenever anybody asks, not that everybody asks me that question quite a lot, but if money is available, I think the first thing that needs to be done is you reverse the cuts that were done there um, across the full range of um, services that were open to people with disabilities um, and not just for carers, but for themselves as well. And then m I suppose for me, the second thing comes down to the solutions that we're trying to find for people with disabilities will not be found, I believe, through um, private um, funded uh, ventures. I just don't think so. Um, I, I, I fear sometimes it's very hard to monitor um, when it's private transport or private housing. Um, they're, you know, it's very hard to proof, disability proof what they're doing. Um, if it's public transport, if it's public housing, then you can monitor it and you can disability proof it. Um, and there's more kind of responsibility then because it's, you know, it's our money, our taxes are going on these public services. So for me, yeah, I mean, if it was the case that, you know, a minister or the teacher said, you know, X amount of money is available for Galway. Those would be the first things I would be saying is, you know, reverse cuts, pump money into the public sector um, to provide services for people with disabilities. But then thirdly, and I think this is a more wider thing, and myself, Aaron and Marion, we all spoke about this at a, at a debate there a couple of weeks, I mean, months ago before the before the ele local elections. It's about planning. Uh, it ultimately comes down to planning and w he could give us billions it still won't change the planning decisions that are made. These, you know, this is what this. There's no price on that. There's no price on going. Look, uh, as Marion said, uh, you know, the thirteen percent of our population have some form of a disability. Why are we not then proofing our structures and whatever we have so that it accommodates people with a disability? Um, we can't ignore that anymore because ultimately, what what we have then is is we have these horror stories, absolute horror stories of people trying to get by. Um, and they're, you know, they're getting stuck from a, getting A to B. And I just want to bring up one case yeah. um, that, that we had to deal with. And I, um, I won't name the buildings now because I, the, the, the actual building, it was, at, it was at fault here. It was actually a very good uh, business. And I don't want to, I don't want to out them or anything. But uh, the Galway Anti-Racism Network, we usually hold our meetings on a Tuesday um, upstairs in a, in, a, in, a, in a certain office. But the lift to get up there was, was broken. And one of our members who is in a wheelchair, uh, who's in direct provision in the Great Western, he rang me while he was downstairs and I went, Joe, I can't come up. The lift's not working. Um, I'll just go back to the centre. And we said, no, wait one second. We'll just bring the whole meeting downstairs then. You just wait down there. So we brought all our chairs down and we sat in the foyer of this building. People walked past and were asking us questions. And we said, well, 
he couldn't come up to us so we just thought we'd all just come down to him and I think look yeah, at the I end know of exactly where he's talking about, about you, know what I mean? you know what I'm talking about Ryan yeah, you do I mean this is obviously not it, it's something I think that can be done that for me and again this reason why I'm on this panel that's an act of solidarity it's to go you know you, you, he shouldn't have to forgo his involvement in a community group just because he's in a wheelchair yeah. Yeah. we should forgo our comfort of having to sit upstairs do you know what I mean that's good and then, then we can all enjoy being in that community group together and you know our disability the disability that person had is not hindering them from their involvement I think that's kind of the way I look at it well if if I had all that money ooh, wouldn't I have a great time <laughs> <laughs> is that what you do with it you just spend it all on yourself no Harry. it wouldn't be on myself I don't think too many people would be happy about that now <laughs> I'd put a definite I think transport would be top of my list and the personal assistance service because uh, I think the personal assistance service that uh, is done through the health board is a joke at the minute um, you know people don't get the, the hours they deserve when you come to a certain age you are excluded then you're no longer on that database you're shifted to the older person's database so uh, guess what you're cured you don't need a personal assistant mm. you know which is ridiculous and um, you know it's they just don't take it seriously enough and, and the other thing is that the housing um, Aaron and I had a conversation yesterday about the housing and I hope he tells the story he told me on the phone yesterday because I was absolutely appalled in relation to the access into buildings and all that but um, yeah, I mean, we really have to take a serious look at our city here. Um, you know, there's little bits and pieces done around the city, but there's, you know, if, if you were to look at the city, it's it's absolutely appalling for it's, I suppose, for Can me. Can you give a few examples, Marion? You know, specific well, places speci in the city. Uh, well, Air Square is a, a nightmare because sometimes mm. the lights aren't working. Now, for me, as a visually impaired person, um, I need the audible signal to be working on the lights so and that is I it know. always not always no okay. uh, there is quite a lot of the tactile paving around at different uh, points in the city that the some of the tiles are quite loose so they're a bit buckety well, I which is dangerous for everybody that, actually because yes. I mean I, I had sort of slippy shoes you know the sort of smooth bottom shoes mm -hmm. and I, I walked on that in the rain and I nearly ended up on my backside. Yeah. Do you know? They changed. If you remember when Air Square was done originally, they had the silver big bobbles. Do you remember yes. those? And then they took them out and they put they, in the They were the ones, thing. yeah. They were the ones they weren't that were very, good. very, very slippy. And if anybody, if any ladies had any little bit of a heel at all on their shoe, mm, uh, because the yeah. bobbles were done too, too big on them, you know. Yeah. But yeah. I think, you know, we have a new city council here and I think they really have to get their act together. They all signed up to the uh, Equality Votes Manifesto. The community sector are going to hold them accountable to really start in their five years now to do something and by golly at the end of that five years they better have something changed because mm -hmm. in the last five years I personally don't see much changed in this city in relation to, to access. Um, I don't know. It's just, uh, it's it's appalling, really. You know, uh, as um, I was Jujo said something about ticking the box. Yeah. yeah, yeah you yeah. know, uh, and this, you know, they're, they're going around with social inclusion and they're kind of throwing everything into those two words, yeah. you know. Guess what? It's very, it's not inclusion, it's no. exclusion. It We've all experienced it, you know. Well, I, I, I've seen regularly, actually, Aaron, you know, speaking of access, I've seen Aaron in a wheelchair in the middle of the road actually going along because, you know, I'm not sure that the, the sort of ramps for wheelchairs and so on on the pavements are actually sufficient in many places. Am I wrong about that, Aaron? Um, yeah, no, I could, uh, I could speak a little bit about that and mm. then uh, I would say a bit... Uh, I mean, that would seem like a no-brainer, really, really, that we... Well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, a, a, a lot of people are wondering, uh, why do I go on the road a lot of times? And, and I think I have mentioned this to Marion yesterday. Um, whenever you go on, uh, on the footpaths, mm. uh, the footpaths have brakes on them. So every meter, there's a little brake on the footpath. So when you're traveling along at your uh, designated speed on the wheelchair, you get a bump, uh, you have a bump like every time uh, you're passing because some of them are raised, some of them are lower. Mm -hmm. So you go bump, 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 bump. And, then and is that very uncomfortable? And it's really uncomfortable. And you, um, what I love is the cycle lanes. I love the cycle lanes <laughs> yeah. because, um, you know, they're they're smooth. smooth yeah. So so whenever there's a cycle lane, I go on that yeah. uh, and, and it's smooth and it's comfortable. I don't get a headache. Is um, it safe, Lauren? 
Well, I, 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 there's the uh, bicycle lanes are safe enough, but I, I was, um, I traveled. That's probably because uh, there's no bicycles on them. That's it. That's it. <laughs> but I did, I did travel to to Holland. I was on Holland in holidays, and uh, I got to experiment a lot of. Um, um, a, a lot of um i went on the on the on the um on the bikes uh on the bike lane there but i did get beeped out of the way from the cycles cyclists there uh, they're really proud of their uh, cyclists in holland are really proud of their bicycle lanes and they don't want to see a wheelchair user using it mm. you know um but I, I don't get that in ireland um but in, in relation to the um billion euro um, um question um there, there is a there is a lot of things that that can be improved um and we have made big strides uh, mm. uh the government is trying really hard to to um provide well, give us a few examples aaron i mean you know like it sounds to me like just simply smoothing over the cracks on the pavement pavements would be something you... uh, yeah it's 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 one of um uh, it's one of the the things that can be solved but but um um you know a bicycle lane can be used by multiple people, um, and I, I I don't see I don't see why we should have we should have more of them. Uh, but yes, uh, we need to we need to take care of the way we design everything from from uh, uh, footpaths to to buildings. Mm. Um, I was I was saying to Marion yesterday that um, uh, in Shop Street. There is a section of Shop Street near the Latin Quarter, um, where a lot of the buildings are under um, uh, heritage protection, um, and this means that they don't have to um, adapt their buildings um, if it is a danger that that the building might fall apart if mm. you were going to put a ramp, or if if uh, um, if you, if the ramp that you're going to put in place. Um, is going to cause uh, injury to the public, like they might fall over it or something like that. Yeah, so the people in medieval times didn't really care much about disabilities or they didn't really plan for disabilities. No, you see... Well, they were kept inside. They weren't they, allowed they, out. They, yeah. You know, there were, um, you know, it would be like the institutions that we, we have had in Ireland. They were institutionalised yeah. and they just didn't get out. You know, thank God that that's changing and people are... You, you're seeing people with disabilities mm. more and more out yeah. and about, you know. And I think that's something that the government really has to look at as well as um, that young people now are getting their education. I mean, back in the day when I was diagnosed as a 12 year old child, uh, my mother was told, oh, she has to go to the blind school in Dublin. And my mother kind of, oh, she's not blind. She's not going there, you know. And um, I was starved of my education. I had national school education and that was it. But now your young people, you know, there is supports within schools now. It's not 100%, oh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's there. It's much better than what it was. And you have young people with all different impairments getting yeah. degrees and masters and they, they are going they they're the, have the qualifications to go for employment but yet there's the barrier then the employers are still not at the stage of accepting and this is your your baby um Aaron that the employers are still not at the stage of accepting people with disabilities into the workforce yeah. and i think too there's a lot of work that needs to be done with the general public in your work colleagues accepting you into the workforce. There's such fear. There is terrible fear out there. You know, there's fear like I'm I have fear every day I put my foot outside my front door and what obstacles are going to. It's it's a little bit easier with a guide dog when the guide dog works really well, you know, that you have confidence in your dog that he'll bring you around obstacles and, and so long as you know where you're going kind of thing, you know, but we ourselves have a lot of fear. But then again, there is fear on the, the general public and, you know, people are afraid, oh, God, if I say the wrong thing to that person, oh, they'll yes. bite the head off me, you know, or something mm. like that. So we have a lot of work to do ourselves. And I think that's why it's so important that disabled people come together. Um, and I'll 
throw a little bit of an ad in here for Galway Activism. Galway <laughs> Activism is a group. We want disabled people to come together. It's not about service providers. And we have great service providers in this city and county, you know, and they're doing great work. But I think it's time now that we, the people, get into the new independent living movement that that's evolving and, and happening in Ireland and, and to link with other groups like Joe has said, mm. you know, we've had this conversation before we came on that um, you don't have to be white just to have an impairment. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's yeah. people from other yeah. cultures and yeah. yeah. Mike, you, you had some listeners questions there. Yeah. Yeah, from some stuff in on Facebook here. Uh, so Hope first of all, easy. <laughs> maybe a couple of comments. Uh, the first one says that well said Marion wheelchairs are freedom and independence. The second one says, language matters, wheelchair bound is not appropriate. And then, uh, sorry Siobhan guys. <laughs> you got done with that one. And Siobhan Cawley came in then and said that abled is the opposite, not able bodied, hmm. as we were into the wording. Hmm. So, any, any comments on any of that, Aaron? Um, you could put up your microphone there, Aaron. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, able bodied or a uh, person with variable abilities um they're all just words but at at the end of the, yeah, at the end of the day that that uh, um, uh, what what Marion uh, stated is is um is we have we have the ability to to make things accessible but but in history we design we design steps because they look nice and and we don't think about um functionality yes um and and uh, just just to go back in uh, in relation to to um, shop street and some of the shops there um, is that uh, I a few years ago I've conducted uh, an independent research for myself to find out if um, if the shopkeepers uh, would get a ramp for the, uh, so that a wheelchair user can can access their their um, their services and purchase things um, and some of them frankly didn't want our business uh, mm. and and uh, they, they, they shopkeepers didn't want your business yeah, the shopkeepers didn't want our business the restaurant didn't want our business they said no I'm not interested in getting in getting uh, a ramp because I don't need you I don't need your business I think that's and and that's 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 uh, that's what I came across yeah, I think yeah. that's absolutely you know. appalling. Just to come back to Siobhan's um, comment there about I absolutely hate using that term abled bodied <laughs> because I am quite an abled bodied person. Me too. Uh, my <laughs> eyes don't work. That's it. You know, I remember when uh, my eldest daughter had her first little baby. Hi, Ben and Dylan and uh, Lucas, I hope will be tuning in from Sydney sometime. But, uh, we, you know, from the time <laughs> from the time that Ben was was uh, uh, able to talk and able to understand, he was thought that Nana's eyes are broken. Yeah. The awareness that that little boy has now at nine years of age when he's, you know, if I'm out and about, you know, be care, you know, he knows how to um, get me over a step or if he's explaining something to me or he actually reads a book for me now instead of the other way around, yeah, right, you know. Yeah, right, right. So it's a day, you know, when a child grows up with that. So uh, I don't like that term and I do try to stay away from it. I would love to see those three little letters and I've said it so many times before. D.I.S. Get rid of the D.I.S. Yeah. and look at our ability. That was going to be my next question to you. Because <laughs> the last time we discussed this, uh, you were really pushing the ability side of it as opposed to this. So maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think each and every one of us that has whatever impairment and, um, you know, every single day you have so many babies born and babies will be born with some little maybe bit of an impairment or whatever might develop into something. So, um, you know, get rid of, of the dis, but every single one of us have different abilities. And I think it's very, very important to focus on that. And I think that's up to us to educate and uh, for somebody that has been starved of their education as a young child, I would always be an educator and uh, try and educate people, you know, and uh, I've been around Galway quite a long time now and it's been said to me, but, you know, you, you, why do you go to all these things? And I'm very selfish. I, I go to all the things that I go to. Number one for me because it's getting me out of my house, it's getting me out, I'm meeting people. 
But the second thing is, if by me being honest about my own impairment, that if that helps educate the general public. Uh, I remember Joe saying, uh, and it's it's thanks to Joe and Mike that I actually put my name forward for the local elections (laughs) because I was blown away with what Joe had said, that he had learned so much from me because we've been involved in the community network for so long, you know. So it was really that night it really brought me home and I said, well, yeah, thank God I've been out there and, and I have the ability to talk. I yeah. can see, but I have the gift of the gap. <laughs> you certainly do, Marion. <laughs> I, I think it's a great program. shame you weren't elected to the council now, to be honest. I mean, you know, one thing you've said, I think, very much hits home. You, you said ability, focus on ability rather than disability. But, you know, I mean, I think everybody has variable abilities, yes. you know, and that's mm-hmm. the reality. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody has, I mean, I don't think there's one amongst us who feels we're perfect. I, I certainly don't. I mean, I, every day I get up on my creaky knees and my, you know, my uh, sort of, I have a headache. All that old age. You know? Old age. And these glasses, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not thankfully visually impaired, but, you know, I, I certainly don't see anywhere near as well as I used to. Mm-hmm. And in time, you know, eyesight is going to become a problem for me. Mm-hmm. Hearing can be a problem for a lot of older people. Mm-hmm. Do you know? And you see, that that goes to that if the older person's groups get, you know, I mean, we really do have to start this linking up and joining the dots of all the, don't we, Joe? Do. All yeah, the different yeah, yeah, organisations, yeah. because, you know, as, as people get older, they need mobility scooters, they need mobility aids to get around, they yeah. might need the supports of the National Council for the Blind if it's something to do with their eyes or their ears. I mean, the hearing impaired is forgotten about quite a lot when it comes to accessibility. Um, you know, and, and I'm not in a position to talk about that because I know very little, but I know there is certain loop systems and different things that would enable people with a hear- hearing difficulty to, to hear better, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there there is a... There's an awful lot that needs to be done, and I think that um, we're we're lucky in one sense that we have a minister for disability now, and he has made um, strides at trying to get the different departments to come together, because disability overarches every single department. Even though we're all piled into the Department of Health, and we're all sick. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I today I'm not sick, yes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, uh, that's, you know, that's for certain. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, we're we're uh, disability is in the Department of Health, you know. Yeah. But like we're involved, we want transport, we want houses, you know, we want education. So yeah. So Marion, look, if you just just if you had been elected to Galway City Council, if you had been elected, what what would be sort of two or three key things that you would try to achieve over that five year term? I mean, I, I know that's maybe unfair putting it to you, but you know, you did run for election, so I mean, it, it it potentially would have happened. The first thing I would do is have each and every city councillor to do disability equality training. Yeah. Very good. I think all of the staff within city council now there has been some done, and they'd probably come back and say, "Oh, well, we have it done," but mm. I think you can never have enough of it. Mm. Uh, I think the disability equality training should be done uh, like uh, by people like Aaron and I that have the lived experience. And I, that's one thing that we in the independent living movement is trying to get across now. It's the social model of disability, not the medical model. And we really, really have to focus in nothing about us without us. And um, that um, I think... Oh. <laughs> What was that? <laughs> that was ourselves coming back. <laughs> We're talking to ourselves here, Mary. So the next thing I would do if I if I was sitting at the table is that I would have equality and human rights at the core of everything. Yeah that City Council do. And we have an equality and human rights statement now. So we have to start holding our City Councillors, you know, accountable for what they do. And particularly, we've all spoke about access. I think the planning and the design, we must focus on universal design. And if it's universally designed, well, then it's for everybody in the community. And that will save money in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. And Aaron, you got here on the bus today now. Can you tell us about that? Was that actually an easy thing to do? Is is the whole system designed to suit somebody like yourself? Um, well, uh, it's it's a lot better than, than it used to be, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember when I was younger, my my mum used to uh, take me out of the chair, fold the chair. When I, and I was living in Dublin at the time, 
um and and that that was hard enough that we you know it's a stressful um uh situation and and i think i remember one at one time the the i was on the bus and the bus driver left without my mom and she had the wheelchair so i was like on the bus would sitting on the bus and the, the my mom they didn't take my mom and she had the chair so it was like she was trying to stop the bus driver from going too far it's like uh, it's stuck stop there because the uh, I, I need to get on because my son is on the is on the bus and he needs the chair you know um but luckily now it's really accessible um uh, i had f uh, uh, various problems with um city direct mm -hmm. um uh where they wouldn't spend money in um uh keeping their um their um ramp uh in functioning order uh and that is the uh, that's the that's uh, one of the issues and has that changed now i i don't know but because the, 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 i from from what i heard is that the way that they do it is that they get they wait and they get a new bus rather than spend money in fixing existing buses and that, that has been my experience uh uh for a while and um, they have few new buses now uh but th this is the problem with the with the private sector um is that they do things that is financially viable for them sometimes it's not financially viable for them to fix the ramp because they have to hire a person from the uk to come and fix it or 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 it might be too expensive um or they might not have spare buses to take that bus off the road in order to be maintained there's various there's various things uh, various obstacles of them for them to choose why not to fix something why not to maintain something um but the thing is it's important that no matter what service you're providing you have to uh uh serve everyone in the community um and as long as they're not disrupting and they're not being violent um and things like that why should you deny deny them uh, uh access to your service mm. you know could could i just come in on on in relation to the buses and the accessibility while it has improved definitely with ramps being available yeah, yeah, for the right. wheelchair user for the blind and visually impaired community it's an absolute disaster because you're at the mercy of the driver when you get into the bus and you say oh i want to get off at such a place now not too bad if i'm going from Knocknacarra to air square you know you, you know but if you want to get off any place in between and you let the driver know can you stop at such a place and sure nine times out of ten now it's hard to expect the driver to remember but I mean with all the technology that's available now and it is available in Dublin yeah. that there is the audio described it'll tell you the stops you're at mm. you standard know stuff. Yeah, and standard. that doesn't happen in Galway no is that right? it does it not happen so in that's Galway. clearly one no. thing well a lot of the buses they have it up on it but it doesn't work <laughs> yes, it's 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 that's what I can't like, understand yeah. like they just yeah. have it there and yeah. it's not the voice is no longer being read out over it anymore and for me as an able-bodied person I'm uh, sorry an able, I shouldn't say able-bodied but an abled person when I'm on the bus um, it's fine that that's broken but I like they don't realise that these little things that they don't fix yeah. means that somebody's going I'm not gonna I can't get the bus to them because I, I don't know where it's going do you know what I mean I, I don't know what's happening and I mean the only point I suppose I want to just add in there just because you know we're talking about like you know what we can do as a city just to you know allow people to live a decent life but even just to enjoy life um in in, in galway um there's I, I want to plug a couple of things now it's nothing related to myself now but there's an actual uh, night that happens in the roisin dove called bounce and it's for people with intellectual disabilities um and it's a disco um and basically what it's done is is it's basically saying you know people with disabilities can go out and have the crack too and have pints and drink and dance and we should be able to facilitate that and that's that happens in the in the in the roisin dove down the west end of the city i don't know if it happens anywhere else but it, it happened it was happening there maybe once or twice like every every couple of uh, months it, it, it i think it's going to be coming back and then on top of that again as, as a proud going united fan one thing i uh, one thing i noticed that's one of them anyway <laughs> <laughs> sorry that's <laughs> that's ter actually no in fairness we should all be proud we should, galway united we should, fans we should, we should. sorry we're <laughs> deviating from the point here now aren't we and good we luck are. to the galway girls today exactly yeah um, the, especially in the camogie as well but i suppose what i was going to say was they, uh, when I was at the match there on Friday, I realised, you know, if you're if you're visually impaired, 
there's very little way that you can enjoy the match. Yeah. Now, a friend of mine, and I'm, I'm going to plug him now, he's, he's a young goalie man called James Flanagan. He actually is working at the moment with, uh, 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 I'm not entirely sure the name of the charity, it could be the NCBI in Dublin, but he's basically rolling out, he's one of the first people to roll out with the Bohemian Soccer Club, um, uh, basically the, the facilities so that people who are visually impaired can enjoy the match as well. So this is a it, it's a brand new thing. It, it's going to be done. What sort of things are they, Joe? So he he uh, his regular day work is 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 I suppose is is blind football. Is he he gets involved in that and, and promoting that, but it's things like that you'd have the match being described. Yes. Do you know what I mean? That you'd say them um, things like uh, and, and when it's being described. You have a little earphone or something, is it? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. That you can plug in the person kind of thing what to do, or that there's somebody in each section where you know there's. Yeah. They, they're able to describe it, it what, what's going on in the match and I mean these are basic things because like I know for a fact I know I know one f good friend of mine who in, in, in university who was completely blind and he, and he had no sight mm -hmm. and he was a mad Chelsea fan like I was yeah. and I used to <laughs> straight up in the college bar just sit and describe it he'd be listening now he, he could hear it perfectly he went Joe what happened there and I was like you won't believe him, man. It's actually a horrible, uh, horrible fou foul. And he was like, "I don't want to thank God I can't see that." <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It'd be that type of thing. But like, be, I'd have to describe it to him. But then I, I remember thinking, to myself, "This is ridiculous. What if I wasn't here? Yeah. yeah. What if I wasn't here? Would it be nice if there was a facility in the college bar mm. to not just, you know, play the sounds so that you can hear it, but also describe what's happening on the screen? And that, for me, is, these are little things that help people enjoy life as well, which is just as important as living your life. You need to be able to enjoy your life too. So what, what are, if you'd been elected to the council, Joe, in terms of um, disability, I, 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 I'm yeah. reluctant to use the word dis now, but, but in terms of ability, <laughs> um, what, what would have been your, say, two or three key things that you would have done? Again, I mean, speaking as an abled person, and, and, and I need to qualify every time I say that, but me and Marion know each other through the community network, the PPN, and, and I stressed at a previous event about the importance of that, the importance of that as, as you know, being a vehicle for, for voices that are not usually heard at city council level. I think for me, if I had got elected as a city councillor, I would have been looking, looking to strengthen the community positions on it, on the SBCs because that's where I came from. Mm -hmm. uh, just to explain that language, strategic policy committees. These um, th these committees in the council that advocate or look out over specific issues like housing and transport. Um, often these bodies or these these meet these committees don't have an effective community voice, or if they do, it's one person who has to cater and speak for everybody. And it's it's tough for them, yeah. I you know that they end up being not just a person for people with disabilities; they're also the person for people of color, for the LGBT community. They're everything. They literally have to they have to put down fifteen hats and they go and they go. God, I better make sure I represent all the communities. Yeah. That's impossible. It's very difficult for somebody to do on a voluntary basis. They're also not an elected politician. I know I've done it sometimes in the joint policing committee, trying to be the voice for people of color and the voice for cyclists and the voice for people with disabilities. And you go, I'm, I'm I can't do this. Wouldn't it be difficult on the council too, though? It would be, yeah. I mean, obviously, it would. It, it definitely would be. I think, though, like what would, what needs to happen th then is the better democracy. And I mean, I think we've seen this in in with town hall meetings that can't happen in the city, or you know, the SBC doesn't have to be the 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 last uh, uh, decision making uh, process for the community sector before you even get there. When it comes to the PPN, the Public Participation Network, and what it does in its when its monthly or weekly doings. There should be more, I think, uh, engagement with with groups. And I, I suppose, from from my perspective, it's trying to facilitate those voices at the decision making level, um, and that when councillors are going into meetings, that they know they're under pressure. That they know but they're under pressure. The thing about the it is now, um, Joe. Sorry for cutting no, across right. you here, but <laughs> the like of Joe and I now as two really good community people we are excluded that's right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> just from. to let you all know out there yeah. from. that i had to resign from my position as a social inclusion person on the local community development committee yeah. because i was a candidate in the local elections joe is in exactly the same position we are excluded from being a community rep on the structures within local government for 12 months but in months fairness now. that's the case for everybody regardless of ability or disability 
it's a case if you run for the council, you can't then go in by the back door to be a rep on the on the community level. So, mm. I mean, I don't think, I, I just wouldn't want people to get the idea that no. this is discrimination against people discrimination with disabilities. I suppose, I suppose like, w- the point that me and Marion would have both be there is, th- is that, you know, voices are being lost. Voices are lost. And, w- and where, where there is a, you know, where there's a dearth of community voices or there's not enough, you know, as, as Marion and Aaron keep saying, lived experience. I think you need to hear lived experience at these SBCs, whether yeah. it's people with disabilities, whether it's LGBT people, whether it's people of colour. Yeah. You need to hear this because otherwise... I don't think people and I got this from the Goy activism group anyway those people that organise that don't feel like as if they're being listened to at all they again to use the expression I used at the beginning it's a box ticking exercise and often you know you could have one politician that maybe does something quite progressive for people with disabilities and then they're seen as oh that's the guy that helps the people with disabilities but it's not good that you just do one thing yes. do you know what I mean yeah. fair yeah. enough yeah. let's say if one of the councillors tomorrow fixes the things on the buses that we were talking about that, that read out where it's going that should be him then that should be the start of something rather than going that's I've done, done it now, now. Grant, I've done it now. Yeah. my box yeah. for, you know for the rest yeah. of yeah. time and, and yeah. that's unfortunately I'm not saying that everybody's like but that's a lot of the time that's what I see it's not bad intentions but it's almost just you know if I make one cosmetic change that will make the life better for all these people it's not not. but isn't there a regulatory role as well in all this I mean it's not just down to voices being heard because you know people can keep saying things it doesn't mean that necessarily the the thing on the books the bus gets fixed does it do you know and people keep moaning about it but it doesn't mean anything actually happens do you know isn't, isn't there a case really that we need to be tighter on the regulatory thing because I mean we talk about ramps on pavements mm-hmm. and yet I've been on journeys with people you know and and you come to a point where there's no ramp, no ramp you know and, and and the point is that that if, if, if somebody's trying to get from A to B and halfway along there's yeah. no ramp then then they can't get from A to B and no, it doesn't matter how many good ramps there are that's it. you know it's just that's that's the end of that's it, the end of it yeah. that yeah, comes yeah, back yeah. then to the planning and design yeah. and, and when Aaron and I were talking yesterday we were talking about that Aaron was saying about all of the unfinished that they yeah. do things in little chunks and oh, we've that chunk done now that's great we've ticked that yeah, box yeah, now yeah, you know yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, you it could travel so yeah you yeah. could travel on that part of the footpath and then you know I had um, an experience only in April there where on the if anybody knows in Knocknacarra where I live on the Shangarth Road mm-hmm. it's the road down from the church to Joyce's mm-hmm. supermarket so uh, they started putting in some tactile paving and crossings. Mm. So I thought I was doing the right thing, getting Leon to find the crossing for me all the time so that I'd cross at the designated spot. So I had a trainer up from Cork because himself was doing a few little things wrong. And the trainer said to me, well, now, Marion, don't use that one because he said it's positioned wrong because you'll end up out in the middle of the road. A dog needs to go directly in a straight line, curb to curb when he's crossing, but these are at angles. So there again, where was the consultation with the people Mm -hmm. who are actually using it? It would be exactly the same for the wheelchair user. Does that ever happen, Marion? Have you ever been consulted? No. Never by any uh, official or builder or council worker? No. Or designer or planner? No. What about you, Aaron? N- not at all. Dale, I think this, yeah. this answers your question. You just yeah. said there, you said uh, the regulatory side of it. And uh, I'm going to say the same thing again. We need monitoring bodies in this country. We need, to, you know, m- m- I work very closely with the traveller community and they ta- they call it traveller proofing. They traveller proof everything. Uh, the Goy Traveller Movement does. Everything that's proposed by the government, they go, has that been traveller proofed? Have you actually asked travellers about it? And I think the same thing needs to happen with, with this, you know, with what you were just talking about there before that even comes into consideration about the ma- changing the curbs. They should go, actually, what would this look like for the sizable um, population of people with disabilities in, the, in this community? Let's find out. Now, that's the consultation part. Once it's actually in place, there needs to be a regular monitoring. There needs to be, and this is why I talk, to you, talk about the difference between public and private. I don't think that can happen with private infrastructure or private bodies. I don't think it can because, you know, it, it's like large multinationals putting a rainbow flag outside their uh, outside their office for pride, yet they then, then a couple of weeks later, they're probably, you know, they're, they're not exactly the most LGBT friendly group. It's, it's a boxing exercise for them. With public bodies, we can actually have parts of our governmental departments that are just dedicated to proofing the housing, the transport, the health and education structures that we have in place that are meant to cater for people with disabilities. We can have a part, we can have people employed, for me personally, it should be people with disabilities who are able to go, 
this isn't good enough, guys. We need to do this again. Or it's a great plan, but you've left out at this a section of the community. Yeah. For example, we haven't even mentioned here today people with, uh, who, you know, with autism and, and Asperger's. And I suppose the proofing things for them. I mean, it, it seems to me that they're totally forgotten about when it comes to sensory uh, 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 infrastructure. And I think people with disability ourselves are very bad at knowing what's important for other people because that came across to us very much in on the 1st of May when we had our hustings you know because we had such a fantastic and thanks a million to all the people that turned up we and we had such a great questions and answer session you know but um, when we were talking afterwards we were saying we are really ignorant when it comes to knowing what's um, accessible for, for other impairments out there. So mm. the the whole education, it's a full circle. It comes back to ourselves being educated as well. You know, I mean, Aaron and I know each other quite a long time. So, you know, but I mean, there's there's other impairments that I personally, I, I don't know what, you know, what is suitable lighting wise. Is this something and, that know? needs to be taught as, let's say, a module in primary school or something? Mm. You know, I mean, you said there's 10,000 people with different yeah. disabilities in yeah. Galway City. Yeah. I mean, surely we should all be made as aware as possible from an early age um, you know the, the issues that face people because yeah I think you're right um, the whole education system in this country needs to be changed now I think things are beginning to change where as children are getting the opportunity to stay in their schools but I just saw on Facebook there this morning where there's 25% of children with um, special needs that uh, they're, they're not able to stay the full day in school and that's probably lack of resources yeah. but we do have the new schools I know there's a few new schools I don't want to mention anyone in particular um, but there are schools now that are very accessible you know they're wheelchair accessible and they, they have children with different needs I prefer that word different needs to special mm. needs because we're yeah, all special yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we <laughs> all have different exactly, needs exactly no I yeah, agree with it yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the children with different needs have the supports there you know so um, compared to years ago when when I was didn't get my education you know that children are getting their education now but it's still it's still not when you when you see there's 25% of children that can't have their full day in school you know there's something wrong someplace and of course the the our TDs and our, our government officials, they'll all, it'll be back to funding, funding. And yet they'll come along telling you, oh, well, we're putting this amount and that amount mm. into the disability. Where is it going, though? Yeah. Where is that money going? It doesn't seem to be fairly divided, if that's, I don't know if that's even the right way to say it. But mm -hmm. As usual, it's probably going to administration and bureau bureaucrats who, who probably don't have disabilities. You know, I mean, that's that's I, I find the same with most things, you know, environment, for example, they say we're putting so much money into the environment. Yeah. And the reality is they're putting it into the environment bureaucracy, which has nothing to do with the actual environment yeah, itself. It's happening on the ground. Yeah. You know, how much actually filters through to people, um, you know, with variable abilities or mm -hmm. with actual needs. I mean, Aaron, um, we're, we're coming sort of, the, I suppose, the last, the final comments. So, I mean, any final comments? I mean... I, 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 I don't, you know, I have to be careful how I, yeah, yeah, a yeah. person who uses a wheelchair, is that, is that reasonable? What? Oh, uh, um, I, I don't mind what you call, what you call me, or uh, how you call me, I, I don't mind. As <laughs> well, long as you don't call him too early in the morning. Um, you were I the first one here today, Aaron, yeah, I uh, uh, yeah, no, I was, uh, I was early because I didn't know what the, what the plan was, or, or what the structure was going to be like, um, but, um, uh, I, I've seen uh, the, some of the comments there that uh, some yeah, people are finding uh, yeah, yeah. some people are finding it uh, uh, difficult or impossible to to get jobs, yeah. um, and for me it has it has uh, been a bit like that. Um, now the affairs to the government they they have introduced they have various services in place like uh, employability. They have the wage subsidy scheme. Uh, they have the uh, accessible grant. Uh, uh, which can be a max of uh, some 6,000 euros. The problem is, is that, uh, let's, let's just say that I am an employer and mm -hmm. uh, my building, I have, I have the ideal candidate. Uh, it is a person with a disability or with a, a person with a varying ability, whatever word you like to use or you prefer to use. But the 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 secret to that is to 
to enable the skills that that you desire from that person first you have to apply for funding so that they can come into your door because you arrange to have the meeting in a cafeteria because your building is not fully accessible so you they couldn't even enter your 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 building for an interview and i've been in that experience as well where mm -hmm. i couldn't even enter the the interview room right so okay. they they had they held the room in a in a separate uh, uh, place um a so that that happened um and then you have to apply for the funding to make your building accessible so they can get in so there's going to be even more delays so um um businesses face this challenge and i don't blame them for choosing a person that's available to start right away instead of the desired person that they wish they had they could access because if they wait for that funding to be made because there's a, there's a process the, 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 there's a process to get that funding first it has to be approved you have to apply for it then it has to be approved uh and so then you could be waiting a month before that person is employed and then as as a business owner you are going to be out of pocket you're going to lose profits uh you're going to lose business especially if if um if you want to employ that person to work in a cashier position uh, because they, they, they're their best person for, for, for the role uh, out of the whole lot of people that you employed. So the way to solve these things is to make your building accessible for everyone, accessible for people to work in, accessible for people to shop in. Um, certain positions should be future proofed accessible so that any person that is interviewed then it doesn't matter what their ability is has a certain amount of accessible features already installed um that it's 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 already so say take for example a receptionist mm. a person who is visually impaired might be suitable for a receptionist role where most of the most of the calls most of their work is to answer phone calls mm -hmm. not uh not write things down on paper or things like that um so the basic thing that will be there is um, a headset, uh, various things that that a typical person who is visually impaired might need, or a typical person uh, uh, who is a wheelchair user might need, which is space. A wheelchair user needs space. So, so if if the reception area is spacey, and the the the, the entrance to the telephone or to things like that is is um uh, uh accessible it doesn't matter who the right person is in relation to their abilities mm. it it is uh, reasonably accessible and then the rest you can apply for funding to the government so the government needs to change the way that it distributes the funding businesses should get access to that funding regardless if a person with a disability applied for that funding or not because that enables them to make their be their workplace future proof accessible uh, and then if the right person happens to be a person with a disability uh or with a back injury and then that's the other thing that that that's that um that we are kind of we are a society of is mm -hmm. we want a person that can do everything yeah and and the problem is and there's no such person there actually. is no such person <laughs> yeah. and and people uh, employers like aldi little robots maybe uh, and yeah. done stores need to um look at uh, uh uh you know you don't want a person that can do cashier that can do stock uh, uh, uh um uh, stocking Stop shelves stocking. be everything because that that's that's uh, that, that's the way the military works mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know we have a society of people with varying uh, varying abilities and just because we injured our backs just because we injured our leg that makes us useless you know yeah. we we, we uh, there are things that we can do there there's ways that we can contribute and and it all starts in the way society is and in that way our children are educated because they they can see in all they can see people with disabilities in all sections of life.
Okay. I yeah. noticed there's some final there's comments. Just from some Mike. final comments here now. We've got coming, coming up. All right. Uh, first of all, Aaron covered the one nicely about employment. It's <laughs> excellent. He must be reading over my shoulder. Which is great <laughs> about that. uh, that's add, okay. That's great. That that one one there, Mike, just on yeah. the employment one as well. I think it's important that the unions um, uh, come out stronger as well in that regard. And, and I can, I suppose, coming down on employers. Advocates. Are, yeah, and advocates are not yeah. actively, you know, employing or you know, let let's say let's do you know uh, let's do research into how people with disabilities are not being employed by certain companies. It yeah. needs to be looked at and the unions, I think, could be the... And uh, there are so many they're people in this country acquire their disability. Yeah. Do you know, mm. and it's, it's a completely different if you're born with your impairment and you acquire an impairment, you yeah. know, that... that mm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Have so you more comments? More comments, yeah, Mike? I have indeed. Uh, one that came up before about the tactile guide uh, and that was in... Um, Salt Hill and the Prom. I think we discussed that before. That's right. And did. that's a very, very important one. Mm. And it was that it's fa it's more or less vanished. Yeah. You know, so that it hasn't yellow been done. Strip, so that yeah. yellow strip. Mm. We talked about yeah, it before. It's very at this stage, yes. yeah. Yeah. Uh, Another one uh, that I would have certainly loved to raise was more, more guide dogs, yeah. without a doubt, because there's an awful lot of funding needed for guide dogs. And there's great work done by, by uh, Frank. Irish guide dogs, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the here. difference a guide dog makes to your life is just yeah. unbelievable. Absolutely. You know, it is. Um, it it takes a lot of the fear. Now, I I am still a cane user and I would use my cane in certain situations, but uh, definitely. But when you're actually mentioning about the guide dogs, and it's something yeah. that I brought up at the public realm uh, strategy consultation that I was at. Yeah, is that still that, going on today, Mary? Uh, it was. There, there's, there was something. A it pop was Friday thing and Saturday. In, yeah, I don't yeah, think it's okay, on it's today. No, today. I think it's finished yeah, okay. today. But this was back in on the first of February. Mm -hmm. But something I brought up in relation to guide dogs, and this Galway city has always been uh, advertised as a big tourist area. Mm -hmm. But there are no facilities for a guide dog owner to come to this. Uh, city in relation to uh, a toilet. I mean, I was away yeah. in Athlone for the dog, for the dog now, now yeah, for the yeah, dog. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. And I know exactly uh, what you mean. Yeah. Having, having, yes, when you had, dog. yes, yeah. 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 Um, it's very and, difficult, and it's a very simple thing to do. That if there was a, a little patch, a designated patch, that you'd have the spending, as they call it, the spending area, that you would have a run. You'd have a bucket there. You could pick up your poo. You could deposit <laughs> the poo in the thing. I mean, if your dog has an accident now in this city, and you're going around carrying a bag of poo for a long, long time, yeah, I can yeah. tell you before you find a bin to put it into, <laughs> yeah, you know. And I mean, uh, I'm after being two days in Athlone with the NCBI doing some training. And um, that was the big issue. There was three guide dogs and we were saying, where are we going to put the poo? What are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that the, we had to go in and say, well, you know, is the, could you put a bin out? You know, so yeah. hotels too can. And it's so simple. You know, there there's yeah. a lot of, of so small little that wouldn't cost the earth. You know, before we finish, if I could mm. just because Joe mentioned um, our Galway City Community Network there, mm. which is the PPN. Uh, my last word would be for anybody listening to us uh, from the community sector, please, please, please get involved in your local community sector because the structure is there to feed into the local government now. Get involved in your linkage groups and that's that's the way to start, isn't it, Joe? Yeah, get yeah. get out to the linkage groups and um, find the way. Because believe it or not, I would have started. When did the Galway City Community Forum, Neil, start? Was it back in 2004? Oh, <laughs> it, it was long. A long it was long. actually, it, it was around then, yes. It yeah. was, uh, 2002, I think. Is, well, is, I was on the, the first steering committee yeah. for the forum. Yes. Yeah. And Gary McMahon used to be the I coordinator. You founders yes. of, the, of the forum yes, indeed. Yeah, back in the day. And uh, we were talking about tape recorders here earlier right, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Gary would record the minutes for me on an old cassette recorder <laughs> and I yes because I had no computer skills I couldn't even Gary. yes thank yeah, you Gary right you know <laughs> this is the computer and communications museum of Ireland <laughs> you know so so, and believe it or not back in the day I didn't open my mouth at meetings would you believe that now <laughs> I'm but not I, sure you're telling the truth there now Marion <laughs> but I went to the meetings and I just I looked at it as this huge big jigsaw and every meeting I went mm. to I could put a little piece back yeah. in and I still to this day kind of use that mapping exercise in my own head because when you're there you can't now I know we have technology and we have the phone but yeah. I still haven't the courage to take out the phone and be have the earpiece in the ear and be using it because I'm too busy trying to listen to what's There's going on yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I yeah, still yeah. have that kind of mapping thing in my head that yeah. I, I kind of look 
look at it as a jigsaw and try and fit in all the different pieces, you know. Yeah. But I would advocate for the people getting out, getting involved and people, as I said, I can't emphasize enough people with the lived experience come out. Uh, I know it's hard and it's not easy done. And I have bad days as well as my good days. But um, I think we can support each other and uh, peer support is a wonderful thing and that if we support each other, we can move mountains. Very good. So, Mike, final word to you. One last one. Maybe Joe wants to take it up. Which daily actions can we do to support the movement for independent living for all? What you um, well, I suppose uh, I'd bother to Aaron and, and, and uh, Marion, um, I suppose, address that. Um, one thing I would do is, and it's something that me and my friends are doing is, and again, the gutter guys know more about this, is the Make Way Day side of things. I live on Lockatolia Road, yeah. um, the busiest road in the city. Uh, I know as an, able, as an able man who's able to walk you know, to and from work every day, I regularly have to walk out into the actual road because there's vans parked up on the, on the, on the footpath. Now, that's me. I see cyclists having to go out on the road until the other day I saw a fella with a mobility scooter uh, and I had to on the road on the road I, he asked me and he didn't want to because he was obviously an independent man living his own he was old enough to, well over to be my, almost to be my grandfather and he turned to me he said young man come here do you mind just telling me is there cars coming down the end there and I, I'll be honest with you I almost lost it I was like this is disgusting you shouldn't have to do this yeah. not on the busiest road in Galway City as well I don't know if anybody knows yeah. Lockatolia Road yeah. well it's a very yeah. busy road it's never quiet and eventually essentially I had to stop he had to come out and even the cars themselves they you know the people in the cars were shaking their head going this is ridiculous that somebody has to do that so so to, somebody uh, on a mobility scooter see. was being effectively forced out onto, onto the road onto the main road because there was vans up on on the footpath yeah and that's very dangerous it is very dangerous and to, like to answer my question there i think that's one way of doing things is we you know is don't shame i don't i don't want to be shaming people but take a picture put it up on on social media and go yeah. go away is better than this and I'm I glad you mentioned do that, Make you know Way I mean? Day because mm. that's coming up now on the 26th of uh, September. And there are different campaigns that different organisations are, you know, holding uh, across the country and even here in Galway, specific ones. And to get out there and support those campaigns yeah. Yeah. because, you know, it's, it's by all of us, like 10,133 people. Yeah, yeah it's a lot now, of people. There that's a lot is. Of people. That's it's a lot, lot of people. Yeah. 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 So, to all you 10,133 <laughs> people who are watching us there yep. today, and hopefully the other, um, what is it, about 60, 70,000 people yeah. in the city, yes. um, very good, uh, very good uh, discussion today, I think. Yeah. Very and I think we'd like to thank everybody. Would you like to thank everybody, Mike? You guys, first of all, Aaron, thanks very, very much for today. Oh, thank you. Great comments. Marianne? I can't believe that you were so quiet when the community <laughs> forum started, you know? Uh, Joe? It's not true. <laughs> it's not true. Ask Gary. Gary will tell <laughs> Joe, thanks for all your comments. Cheers, Mike. Thank you, Rush. And Neil? Cheers, Neil. Thank you very, very much. And thanks to you, Mike. And Excellent. of course, we're forgetting somebody down here. And of course, yeah. Leon, who has been... I was keeping Leon until the end, to be honest with you, because warm, warm, he's been very, very good, <laughs> Leon. And very, very quiet. Yeah. And didn't make any noise. No, thank God. Which is well, good. a few little noises. We, yeah, we, we, we can allow for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... Awesome. Thanks, thanks to everybody for watching and listening. And don't forget to subscribe to us on uh, YouTube, on Facebook, and indeed on Twitter. So um, until the next time, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Is that all fair now?